well, then we become more able to tolerate life itself in these times, you know, the life we're actually uh, experiencing every day. So uh, let me just check my timepiece here. The one thing I do look at, uh, that's about 45 minutes. So if you've heard enough, we can start the conversational part of our program. <laughs> so it's up to you. What do you want to do? Appl applause is accepted. <laughs> Thank you. So, yes, question. Ra raise a hand, anyone. Yes. I'm curious to know where exactly in or around Boston you grew up. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's relevant, but I'm, I'm from the suburbs. Uh, I am from Needham, actually. Yeah. And you? Melrose. Really? Oh, OK. I don't hear enough of, I don't, I don't hear enough of your accent. <laughs> yeah. Have you read Roland Barthes' Death of the Author? Oh, not for many years, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Incredibly applicable to art. No doubt, yeah. In the back. Yeah, all right. I it's kind of a complicated question, but I mean, after all, it's almost uh, 100 years after World War I. And um, it's only some 60 some odd years after World War II. And out of World War I, of course, we got Dada, uh, we had Hemp Hoff, we had John Hartfeld. We had Otto Dix, we had George Gross. At World War II, of course, we had abstract expressionism, pop art. And in a certain sense, it seems to me that there's a death of a culture. Um, Albert Schweitzer wrote from the jungles of Africa, a book called The Decay and Restoration of Civilization. And so my question to you, sir, is as an art critic, where is civilization? <laughs> so I'm, out. <laughs> I'm asking myself that same question. <laughs> uh, well, It has to be claimed for each of us on our own behalf. That's the thing, you know. I mean, it's it, on the one hand, it's in, it's incredibly available. The resources, the the landmarks, uh, the materials of of, of self um, cultivation are more available than they've ever been. Along with all the dross that I was speaking of, that's more available than it's ever been as well. So uh, if we individually don't take this on as a as a task then nothing's gonna nothing's gonna happen you know and one problem I have not spoken of yet but you've opened the door to it sir so I'll take advantage of that <laughs> I'll, I'll go through it um, is that uh, this was going to be a possible starting point for me I think that this culture is in is in a condition of patho this American culture is in a position a condition of pathological individualism which is being used against us. You know, we, are, we receive all this encouragement for thinking of ourselves as discrete and utterly independent units. And we are treated that way in various ways, legally, bureaucratically, uh, psychologically, economically. And we accept this uh, all too willingly, especially if we're proud of being individuals, if we're proud of who we are, we want to stand out, you know, and there's this, one of the things that the uh, one of the tendencies that this uh, mania for for devices um, and for amplifying your own performance of whatever it is through blogging or what have you, uh, YouTube, you name it, uh, that's that satisfies a craving for recognition, which this culture is continually teasing and punishing in various ways. It's very difficult to resist. I mean, we all want recognition of some sort. You know, I, I, I can say this because I've had more than my share, in my view, much, much more than my share. As far as I'm concerned, the plumber who fixes my broken toilet deserves as much recognition as I do because he's done something of real value, you know. <laughs> so, I, he can prove, he can prove, he can prove the value of what he does. How do I prove the value of what I do? And just by sophistry and, you know, this kind of, the, by persuasion, basically. Not that, it, not that what I do is, is meaningless and valueless. I don't think that's true either, because I think that we are, we are all um, permeated by and to some degree constituted by language, the language we use and how we use, how we use it, the language of our thoughts and so on. So. Uh, people like me who, who are kind of trying to mind um, the public sound and look of words and, and their, their effectiveness and their precision 
people in that position are doing something useful too. It's just much harder to establish where that usefulness kind of hits the ground, you know? So, but uh, again, uh, where I find civilization is, is you know, at home. <laughs> uh, I find it, in, I find it in, in relationships with people I actually deal with, you know? And, and when I look back at my parents' life, for example, uh, their social world was so, and their world of travel was so limited compared to mine, incredibly limited, like a different species. They, they met so few people in the course of their everyday lives compared to, to me, and I'm not unusual. I mean, in terms of the number of people I contact and by various means, including face to face. So um, the civilizing process takes place, in my view, in those encounters. Or, or is refused in those encounters. And so I'm trying, um, not only on an occasion like this, but, but just in dealing with people with whom I can deal, <laughs> uh, and it ain't everyone, uh, to, to advance you know, some civilizing um, set of priorities. And, and those will vary with, with my own sense of, of what's important and what the weather's like. You know. uh, Hillary? <laughs> Well, for some of us, um, you evidently included, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, the no man's land between knowledge and nothing is uh, revealed in these, in these hanging words, you know, that these hanging phrases that have no attachment to anything we can quite understand or contextualize. The one that, that strikes me is, is the painting called, uh, gosh, what is it called? The one just inside the door, the big one, that has the word wreath written across, it. maybe it's called wreath. Um, has the word wreath written across the top of it. Well, if you look closely at that, you see there are many other words kind of implicitly written into that, into that word. Um, the R, the T, rather, looks like an R as well. So there's earth in there, actually. And the W, there's a drawing in the show that actually confirms this intuition. The W looks like a, a B that's fallen on its side. So there is breath as well. And on all these, I mean, I think that it's just his hand produces these um, ambiguities, probably without his conscious con contrivance, uh, which is better from my point of view. <laughs> but yeah, it's certainly true that you, you know, one of the things he's involved in, I think, is withholding nameability from his subjects, as certainly in later pieces, after about 1993, for example. He may write the word nude, but you can't really find it in there, <laughs> you know? Uh, you can find sort of the makings of a nude, but you can't really find the nude itself. So the whole process of, of, of nomination through a word uh, is 
begins to break down, you know, and, and you know that these words are not labels. Um, they may just be something that surfaced in his head or in his ears when he was working on the painting at some point. So, uh, but we can't, we can't analyze it. I mean, it's sort of, it puts itself beyond analysis, the, the use of words as well as everything else in these, in these paintings and drawings. So, which is a reason to admire them in my view. It's very difficult to find that kind of hovering um, availability of words. Um, you find it in poetry, for example, where you find where, where, where on, a, on a page you might find the typography leads you to a hovering word, you know, which is not the word you expected <laughs> as you were making your way through the lines. Not at all, you know. Uh, this happens again and again, and it's very well used by certain poets. I decided to leave poetry aside because uh, I think it was John uh, had touched on it in, uh, in his essay. Uh, and I, I couldn't really improve in that observation except by giving examples. And I wanted to give examples of other things like Galen Strawson's uh, self-analysis <laughs> of four seconds of mentation. <laughs> uh, so, um, John, you had a question? Or were you, are you going to say time's up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> well, um, I, I was so, I was, uh, uh, your, your talk just brought so many issues to the fore, and I was thinking about so many things. but. In terms of the, that issue of um, the work opening up this vertical um, uh, dimension, I thought about um, the dross that you were talking about with the, the sort of devices in relationship to art, and um, this presence of irony that's in so much contemporary art today, mm -hmm. <clears throat> this sort of distancing from um, that which the artwork is supposed to be about, and the sort of protectiveness of that posture, in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, and, and it struck me that, that this work is actually without irony, mm. um, in the way that, you know, there's that uh, John Waters movie, Pecker, where they're sort of like, it's the death of irony, and they're dancing with irony, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a joke about the death of irony, how uh -huh. irony never really goes away, but it seems, in a sense, that, that this work actually doesn't have it. Mm. Um, that that, it, it, in, in a sense, I wonder if, that might be a device he uses to cut through this. Yeah, I think it's it's very difficult to um, at the at the present moment or even in the, in the past decade to have escaped irony. And you know, one of the one of the one of the thoughts, if that's the word for it, circulating after 9/11 was that that was the death of irony. You know, we had no more. You know, no more falsifying our pleasure in violence. We want either real pleasure in violence, we'll start a war, or, <laughs> or, or don't bother me. You know, <laughs> so, so that didn't last long. You know, because uh, clearly the, the, the freedom from irony that that George Bush represented. I mean, was there ever a less ironic president? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think not. Not within my memory, certainly. I mean, Eisenhower was more ironic than uh, than George W. Bush. <laughs> So, uh, but it's a very difficult position to attain, and it may be to do with his, um, what, what from our point of view seems like a peripheral position, you know, in, in regards to the international art world, the official international art world. In that sense, his uh, minor recognition, if that's what it is, uh, I mean, it seems to me that everyone who's, who, who, who likes the work recognizes it in a major way, you know? <laughs> but, but he may think of it as minor in the sense that you mentioned Patrick Graham's name. If, even if you'd mentioned it to me two years ago, I wouldn't have known who you were, who you were talking about. And I think that the same will remain true, I'm sorry to say, for, for a while yet, even though the show is traveling um, to several venues across the, across the U.S. So uh, I hope that that exposure doesn't cost him in, in the future, his, his ability not to be ironic. But I do think that that's part of, that's the nature of this work's seriousness. You've, you've pinpointed it, is that it is free of irony. It's not free of compl complication, it's not free, free of mystery, uh, it's not free of difficulty, and it's not few, free of debatability. I mean, many people would find a lot of these pieces unfinished in a pejorative sense, not unfinished in a, in a definitive and declarative sense. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, but that's an argument that wants to be had more broadly, I think, than uh, I'm aware of it being had now. So, 
But then I, I don't know what's going on in our criticism these days. I got to tell you, if I'm not writing it, I don't know what's being said. You know, <laughs> I mean, what I, what, what I do takes everything I've got. You know, I mean, to write, I'm just minding my sentences. You know, day to day, because uh, in, in the newspaper industry, we're under such, which is a dying industry, and it's taking uh, most of us down with it. Uh, we're under such pressure to produce and, and to do what used to be the work of copy editors and photo editors and and editorial clerks that uh, I don't have time to sort of graze around an art forum as I once did when I wrote for it. <laughs> so, so I don't know what they're doing or what they think they're doing. And in a way, I don't care, you know, because I, uh, the experience has made me feel so much more responsible for every sentence I write than I used to feel. And you have no idea how difficult it is to write an 800-word piece and just get the facts straight. You know, I mean that's an incredibly taxing <laughs> exercise. And if you don't do it, you hear about it. You know, you hear about it from readers, from that one reader who's been waiting to pounce on this factual error you've gotten wrong. You know, because it's his obsession or hers, whatever. Uh, you're always hearing from those people. So, um, and what can you say? If you're wrong, you're wrong, you know? I mean, uh, it, it, I just go to an editor and say, does this need a correction or not? They go, please, no, one, no one's gonna know but this guy, you know? So, <laughs> so uh, we, we gotta move on, you know? We got tomorrow's edition to get out or whatever. So, uh, it's, it's become, things are moving almost too fast to read anymore, you know, because there's so much coming at us all, all the time, and it's in, in text form, a lot of it, that just sorting out what to actually read th to the end is, is a, a very demanding, time-consuming thing to do. So do we have one more question from the lady from Melrose? <laughs> oh, I, well, we'll get to you in a moment. Right. And I'm curious about that now. Well, I, uh, my reading is incredibly disorganized. I mean, it's very chaotic and, and opportunistic. So uh, when I was a student, uh, a college student, I was reading phenomenology and existentialism. I happened to go to a school in Pennsylvania, where, which was a hotbed of phenomenology studies very early on in the mid-60s, you know, when this stuff was just being translated from French, a lot of it, or German. And I mean, I had the, in, the incredible privilege of having a, a, a seminar on Heidegger's being in time, you know, a whole semester to read one book, you know? <laughs> it was great, you know? I, I, it's like there isn't that much time around anymore, you know? <laughs> Nor is there that much attention, you know? I find myself taxed to get to the end of a, of a long argument in anybody's book now. You know, it's really, it may be personal deterioration that explains this, but, <laughs> but I blame society. <laughs> so uh, to, quote, to, quote, <laughs> to quote a famous line from Repo Man. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I do think that the pace has quickened for all of us, you know, the, the pace of demand uh, just, and the pace of expectations of, of people with all of these conveniences. And believe me, email has saved my skin and the internet has saved my skin countless times. Uh, it creates a level of expectation and, and, and res anticipated response from everyone that's very difficult to maintain for me. I'm, I'm a slow mover, you know? I'm not a morning person, and uh, as, as the years go by, I'm not, being, I'm not an evening person anymore either, you know? <laughs> I have about a four-hour window now where I can actually keep the pace, you know? I spend those hours at the office, unfortunately. So, uh, yes, you had a question before I... Uh, no, I just, this lady, just, she was just ahead of you, so we'll get, we'll get to you in a moment. It was more of a comment, and it was... I'll accept that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, your question to Patrick Graham about whether how he knew that was finished, mm. or, you know. and I I felt very much when I was standing in front of each piece that I got the sense that there was either a dialogue that he was having a dialogue with himself. I mean, obviously it was my projection, but there was either a dialogue or there was this this dropping into some very deep place and then coming out again, and then of course you know you're out and it's over. Mm -hmm. So. That, that I suspect the latter. I mean, scary. my sense is that the latter is probably closer to the truth. And his statement in the catalog 
if he's being honest, <laughs> also suggests that this is probably close, this closer to the truth, that you enter a certain condition of um, viability uh, uh, with you and the work, and then it, 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 it comes to an end for reasons you can't control. And that's how the work feels. You know, it feels like it, it sort of forced him out at a certain point, and that was it. It just had to be had to be left, it had to be either destroyed or accepted, you know, because it was done. It was done with him. <laughs> so, um, you, sir. I, I'm curious uh, uh, how you would uh, compare uh, the anti-logic of these paintings to the anti-logic of the surrealists, how, how you would see that, what connection you would see or, or non-connection? Well, I, I don't, I don't see any connection that I like, <laughs> that is to say, um, you know, there's an, it, it, there are very few surrealist works about which one feels the sort of um, authenticity that one feels with the strangeness of Graham's work that I feel. Uh, there's an, a level of contrivance, and it does enter in, I think there are points at which you, you can feel him struggling with the wish to contrive, and even maybe sometimes surrendering to it. But for the most part, in, in, the, in the best pieces here, he does not let that tempt him. And the Surrealists were all about provoking a certain kind of response from their public and from the world. And to some extent, they succeeded. Uh, it's only in certain drawings by um, uh, Dolly, for example, early drawings of Dolly and, and, um, and Giacometti, I think, who didn't really consider himself a surrealist. I don't really consider him so him one either, but the, nonetheless, the, what the surrealists were aiming at, the kind of corrosive emotional and psychological effect they were aiming for, the subversiveness, is there in Giacometti's drawings, you know, which I find uh, a desperate confrontation every time I look at one. You know? <laughs> I, I want it. And yet, I know I couldn't live with it. <laughs> you know, to see this every day, I couldn't take it. You know, it would be too much. <laughs> that sort of um, the the erratic quality of those images is is like too true. You know, <laughs> especially in relation to the situation I've been describing here. So, uh, but there, those are like there are just occasional occurrences in surrealism that I can bring to mind that where, where it's, they seem to have the genuineness of, of this kind of, of, of strangeness. Um, sometimes in uh, Mata, uh, you, you find images that are that peculiar. Or in Chelichev, Chelichev's drawings have an extraordinary degree of um, contrivance and surrender combined in them, which I find almost nowhere else in um, surrealist art. John's nodding his head, which is a good sign. So, unless he's nodding off. <laughs> so, uh, that's what I would say about that. I mean, I don't know how it strikes you, but it seems to me that surrealism is a program. And, I mean, it definitely was a program, and there were manifestos. I mean, <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have a manifesto without a program. It may have petered out and, or, or dispersed and scattered, but nonetheless, there was a program there. And this seems to me to be unprogrammatic work, and that's one of its virtues. You know, that's one of the reasons it's troubling to us, is that we can't figure out what the program is, you know, because there isn't one. <laughs> it would be so much easier to cope with if there were. <laughs> so, anything else? <laughs> Your last chance is coming up. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention.